<laughs> Thanks, everybody. Here's Chris. So, hello. <laughs> um, okay. You've probably been looking at Haskell in some form or some way. You've probably been told to do one of these courses or read through one of these books. You've played with Haskell in your spare time and started writing and learning it, which is a good place to start. But none of these books and courses tend to talk about what you can do as far as editing tools and development tools to help you along the way and make it easier than just jumping into a text editor and trying to move text around until GHC manages to compile it. So what we're going to do tonight is we're going to talk through what makes up your Haskell development environment to start with, the basic tools like compilers and package management tools, good ways to set that up, and then a bunch of helpful development tools which will help you make cleaner and nicer code and make it easier to get it all correct and right. And then we'll talk about how to merge that into one of the two prime editors being Vim or Emacs and briefly mention some of the lesser beings, but we'll start with those two. So, the core of any environment you're going to start with is GHC, which is the Glasgow Haskell compiler. It's the Haskell compiler that you'll see everywhere. It's what everyone uses for all of their production stuff, unless they have very good reasons not to, like they need specially compiled versions of the code, or they're trying to experiment with some theoretical stuff when they want different outputs. But if you're running a production environment, GHC is where it's going to be. It's the only one that's supported pretty much everywhere. By like pretty much everywhere, Windows, Linux, FreeBSD, OS X, uh, Android, iOS, it's on any sort of x86 x platform, um, any sort of ARM platform, it's just everywhere. Standardized language works everywhere. It's very nice. Plus, it's extremely extensible. There are these things called language extensions, which lets people add in new features and new ways for the interpreter to work. They can lift rules that are placed on the type system or imply new ones or transform the code. They can do lots and lots of things. It's all built into GHC. It all works really well, and it's all really nice. So you can do lots with Haskell with GHC. Next major tool you come across is Cabal. Cabal is your package management system for Haskell. Cabal backs onto a system called Hackage, which is a general repository of Haskell, clo Haskell code up in the cloud that everyone uploads their packages to, unless they're private packages, in which case you'll never ever want to share them. Um, you use it for installing packages, maintaining your, pack maintaining your installation, building any code that you're working on, running tests against the code, executing it, whatever you please. It's the general purpose build tool for Haskell. And those two are the two pieces that will be core to any Haskell environment you have. Eventually you might decide otherwise, but you'll be able to argue very well with me about why that would be the case if you ever decide to. Third thing worth mentioning is Haskell Platform, which is an amalgamation of the previous two in a nice, easy to use, installable bundle. Uh, so you get GHC built for your comp built for your platform, Cabal ready to go for the platform, sets them all up in a nice place, and then gives you a ton of commonly used libraries, all at a version that are known to work with each other and are all well tested with each other. This is a nice safe place to be working that will take care of you and you won't have to deal with many upstream problems while you're using this. Haskell platform will work on Linux, Windows and OS X. It's usually pretty up to date, it's a little bit behind at the moment but we'll be seeing another release of that in the coming month or two. And We'll come back up to speed. There's not a whole lot of reason to use it unless you want a completely blank slate or you want complete control over the environment that you're working on. But it makes it a lot easier to install things. So it's always an option if anything I say doesn't work. If you're getting started on Windows, the Windows story isn't too bad these days. There's plenty of Windows users using Haskell. And because there's plenty of users, there's plenty of pressure on the Haskell community and the Haskell Foundation to keep maintaining GHC for Windows. Despite that fact, none of the Haskell core developers use Windows, and the Windows bugs tend to be caught late. But even if they're caught late, they tend to block the release, such as GHC 7.8, the most recent version. It was going to be blocked and delayed by months because no one was fixing Windows bugs. They eventually fixed the Windows bugs and got it released. But community pressure's there, you'll have a good time on Windows, unfortunately. <laughs> I'd like to say it's terrible, I just don't use Windows, but really the story isn't too bad. 
All that being said though, use the Haskell platform windows. It's easier than trying to craft up your own environment just to, to, due to the uh, strange ways that Windows tries to build its environment compared to, like, Haskell was traditionally built on a Unix platform. All the tools link together in a unix -y way. Windows doesn't play as nicely with that, so just use Haskell platform. They took care of all the hard parts for you, and they are really hard parts in some cases. So this just makes it easier. Linux is the most strongly supported platform because it's what developers use when they're doing all the Haskell writing and testing and stuff. Haskell Platform works here too if you want for just a one-click installer, but um, I would generally recommend just stick to installing GHC and Cabal as separate packages from whichever package manager your distro has, be that apps or yum or pacman or whatever your Linux distro likes. Um, that work pretty well and they're usually relatively up to date. If you're on Ubuntu, you probably want to go even further up to date. There's a PPA that's maintained by Herbert V. Riddell, who is one of the GHC core devs. It's all the way up to date to being release candid up to date. Um, and it's pretty good. If there's any problems, he takes care of them long before the Ubuntu and, De and Debian devs to get around to looking at them. If you don't have sudo on Linux, not everything's lost. You can download pre-compiled binaries for Debian or Red Hat based distros and throw them somewhere in your home directory and run them and throw them on your path and have everything working as you might expect. Or if you're really a little bit masochistic, then you can try and build GHC from source, which is a, um, it's a mission. It's mostly taken care of by the make file, but if you ever have a problem trying to build GHC, you will continue to have problems building GHC because they don't unwind themselves. But point of the story is you can get away with not having sudo. We did it in a um, semi-production environment while we had sysadmins that wouldn't yield to installing anything for us, and it worked out okay. Um, OS X, pretty good story because everyone's got Macs. It's hard, you're hard pressed to go to a developer conference and not see a Mac these days. So just due to their prolific nature, they tend to get things written for them. And they're close to Unix, so everything just sort of worked out of the box. GHC is available as a, as a binary distribution for OS X, so you can set it up yourself if you really want, or you can use Haskell Platform. Otherwise, there's GHC for Mac OS X, which installs GHC and Cabal as applications and then does some magic to link them into your environment so they behave like regular CLI tools. Or you can go and install GHC and Cabal using Brew or Mac ports. Currently, Brew and Mac ports are a, they're a couple of months ahead of GHC for OS X, which is a couple of minor revisions. You won't notice the difference. GHC for OS X will catch up eventually, and GHC, the other catch to that is GHC for OS X is maintained by some of the Haskell core devs. So it's always going to be correct. They've had teething issues with people from Brew and Mac ports before where they don't respect the environment quite well enough. And they've caused issues, but yeah. Use one of those two, they work pretty well. So that covers how to set up an environment, which is a nice start, but now we have to use all of that. So let's first talk about Cabal. Cabal, you can sort of draw this line straight down the middle for. On one side, you have everything for <coughs> maintaining your Haskell installation, installing new packages, talking to hackage, and querying things from the wider world in the cloud. On the other side of Cabal, you've got everything about building your package and maintaining it, building metadata, or uh, compiling your code into an executable, all those sorts of nice things. So first of all, we're going to talk about the site where you manage packages from the greater world. Cabal's got a really good set of help stuff built into it if you ever get lost. Oh, I should stop here and say something I meant to say in the introduction. I'm going to go really fast over all this stuff and not a lot of it's simple. This is more of a talk to say these things exist and go and look at them on your own when you encounter something that might remind you of the talk, not to teach you so much how to use all of them. So if I go too fast, try not to stop me, just grab me during the beers afterwards or something and ask me more questions. We'll find us on IRC, it's really good as well. So, Cabal's got a really good help system built in. It's very descriptive about what things do. We're gonna go over the major functions and say that they exist and you can figure most of the things out from there. Cabal, like most package managers, maintains a list of available packages somewhere within itself and you keep that list updated by doing Cabal update. It does not incrementally update this list, which means you're downloading 20 on May every time you hit the list. Pretty and good. Yeah. Yeah, it takes a little bit. It will, any Cabal command that uses the list, if the list is seen to be too old, like 20 odd days, it'll tell you to update rather than automatically updating. 
when it tells you update, go and run update, and everything gets better. But it's not gonna automatically do it for you, is the point I'm trying to make. Searching for, that ha searching for Haskell packages isn't done through a search command or anything, it's done through the list command. And the query you give it is just a string filter. You can't use regexes there or anything, just pick part of the string. There's better ways to find Haskell packages through a web browser and hackage, which I'll talk about in a bit. But doing it from the CLI, you can do it through file lists if you really want. And installing is, as one might predict, done with the install command with the package name. And then it goes through and you hope to hell that it doesn't throw any errors because you could have problems if it throws errors. Now that we're talking about installing, it's probably a good time to talk about sandboxes. Initially, when you install GHC in the bar, it's going to want to install everything to your system library paths, like much like anything would on a Unix style system. These system library paths are the root for any package resolution that gets done, and they get shared by literally every Haskell thing you try to compile. This isn't necessarily always a good thing, because the system libraries then get very crowded. And crowded, li crowded library paths aren't good because you want to have multiple versions of libraries and you want to not have interfering versions of libraries or some libraries might just have files in them that collide with one another, which is kind of crap. So you want to have your own nice little section of the beach all to yourself where you can put exactly what you want and not have to worry about all these other horrible people causing a mess on your beach. So you create what we call a sandbox, which is a library path which gets checked before it reaches back to the system library area. And it's all nice and safe. All the cabal commands which do anything to look at the package, so anything to look at the package installations, all know about the sandbox and will try and automatically use it for you if it finds one. It's all very nicely built into the Haskell tool chain. It works really well. As developers, we like to think that we can keep a sandbox like this and put everything in exactly the right place and know where everything is, how to clean it all up, and we're professionals, so of course we know how to do this. But we're not, we're terrible at it, and we make messes, and eventually you're going to want to destroy the sandbox because it just gets worse and worse over the course of a couple of months of using it. Because it's a sandbox and slow place to your project, you can delete it and throw away and start over. And that's a very common thing to do the moment you see any problems. So, using a sandbox. Sandbox init will create a sandbox that's living inside the current directory. So usually in the root of your project or something, it creates a file that tells it the configuration details of the sandbox, which you shouldn't ever have to edit, and it creates a directory where it starts installing packages to. Except that they're there, have them to get ignore, and just never touch them by yourself. Sandbox delete deletes the sandbox so you can start over and knit a new one. Sandbox add source, list source, and delete source. If you're working on other Haskell libraries and that you haven't pushed up to package or you don't have available from any private sources, you can tell the sandbox where to find those and when it goes to install it, and it checks through those lists of sources before it goes and looks online or in any of the public repositories, which makes a nice way for you to work on multiple libraries at a time all feeding into the same sandbox. Cabal by default does not require you to have a sandbox or try and use the system libraries, which is a nice same default, except when you get used to nuking sandboxes and realize that you're going to happily destroy your system libraries if you don't prevent yourself from doing so. So you can pass into Cabal or any Cabal command a require sandbox a require sandbox flag which tells it I require a sandbox before I go and do anything. You can also say I don't require a sandbox. The reason why there's both is because in the config you can change the default to be requiring a sandbox, and occasionally you do want to do things without a sandbox and just reach into the system libraries and start manipulating those. So in those cases, it's good to be able to turn it off with a flag rather than go and change your config file and everything. It is a good idea to turn on sandbox requirement even if it looks like more overhead to begin with because once you back yourself into a corner, if you have to delete your system libraries, you're uh, not going to have a good time. But if you've got a sandbox, it's really safe to delete it because it's directory that you own. You know, nobody else is using and just destroying it doesn't matter. So when something starts going wrong, you could from orbit, it's really the only way to know that everything's being cleaned up. When you're using Cabal, it will refuse to modify any packages that unless you explicitly mention them in the install command, it'll report it'll report success on an installation if it doesn't have to modify any installed 
packages. If you try and install something that requires a new version of a dependency you have installed, it'll refuse to go any further. You can force your way through all these things, but in such cases, it's usually better just to destroy the sandbox and start over, let it recalculate the whole dependency tree from nothing. And it's really good to calculate the dependency tree the first time. After that, it's not so good at it, so you destroy the sandbox and you start over. It's always the safest option. It takes about five minutes compared to an hour of you looking at errors coming out of the file that make no sense to anyone. Ah. So, now to the other side of Cabal, where you use it to maintain your own packages. Cabal init is a command for starting a package in the current directory. And it'll ask you a series of questions. The first couple of questions it asks you are obvious. It asks you the name of the package, who you are, email addresses for maintainers, all those sorts of simple meta variables that we're used to from just working with software. Then it starts to get a little more Haskell specific. It'll ask you about the project category. On Hackage, the central repository, all the packages on there are divided up into, set into categories, such as data, or DB, or IO, or communications, or a file system, or things that kind of make sense. You're pro unless, initially, you're probably not going to care about the category at all, and it offers you an option of none. Just pick none. By the time you are writing something which you intend to go into one of those other categories, you probably understand the intention of that category. So a category like I.O. immediately doesn't mean something to you, even though you've probably heard of things like the I.O. monad. You'll have explored Haskell by the point that you're writing libraries you want people to use in those categories. So the options there will make sense by that point. It'll ask you what you're going to build, and the options will be library or executable. This just changes the template it uses in the config file that it writes out for you. Um, it's obvious. Executable or library will explain what the template differences look like in a second. It'll ask you about the main module for the package, which is the file in which it will contain. The file that will contain the main, ex excuse me, sorry. It'll ask you where to find the main module of the program, which is the file in which the function named main lives, which is the entry point for the execution. Standard, uh, as a standard rule, it's main.hs, main probably in a source directory somewhere. You can configure it to whatever you want. I'll show you how to configure it in one of the subsequent slides. Just go with the default for now and you can change it later. It'll ask you about including documentation, which makes a cabal file that is about 200 lines long, which is very, very verbose and tells you exactly what each option does. It's probably good for your first time making a Cabal package. After that, you're not going to want the documentation in the Cabal, pack. In the Cabal file. You want it somewhere else online for you to go and look up later. And it asks you about what version to start at. And this is a good point to talk about Haskell versioning. You're probably used to versions that look like 1.22 or Sembers, which have three parts to them, 1.2.3. Haskell uses versions that have four parts to them, 1.2.0.0. If you're familiar with Semba, and is anyone not familiar with Semba? Great. The first two digits of the Haskell versioning are the same as the first digit of Semba. If you do something which breaks someone using it, is not backwards compatible, is not backwards compatible, make sure A and B get incremented. Other than that, it's all the same. C is the same as Semba's Y. It's a feature improvement or something being added to the package. And Z is the same on both of them. It's for when you're patching a minor bug or something like that, which doesn't affect anyone's use of it aside from closing stuff in the bug. Take all that with a grain of salt. So long as the versions increment, you're doing it right. They have strictly me strict meanings behind them as to which one you change, but so long as you're going up, nobody's going to care too much well, until someone tries to use your package, in which case they'll start shouting at you because you use the wrong version scheme, but it's all okay. You're also not forced to use the four-digit version. You can use Semba, or you can use the two AR two-part versioning system if you like. It's not strictly controlled by anything upstream. But convention is good. So, you've gone and created a package with Cabal in it, and this is what you get out of it. You get a package.cabal file, which contains the configuration for your package. You get a setup.hs, which hopefully you never ever have to touch. This is a bootstrapping script for people to be able to install and build your package without using Cabal directly. 
Initially, it never looks like you need a setup.hs, but it's mandated by the people upstream because a lot of systems out there don't have the Kabbalah executable installed on them that still want to build your code. So setup.hs gives them a way to do that. Uh, a source directory is not mandated, but it's generally good practice once again, so that your source code isn't living in the root of your module alongside your configuration. And a main.hs is needed for any sort of executable, packet, any executable that you're building, so there is some entry point into the program. Again, that usually goes in the source directory. And so long as you answer the license question in the meta details, you get a license file. And I should complain, I've been told that I should complain a bit about licenses at this point. You should use a license. There are many, many, many good reasons to use a license, and a lot of them are about protecting you, and other reasons are about protecting other people. If you don't use a license, people probably shouldn't use your code because they don't know what the terms of, your, terms of use are. And if you don't use a license and someone tries to use your code, you're opening yourself up to getting sued or your code being stolen or patented and not attributed or all kinds of crazy things. So a good idea is to go and familiar yourself with licenses, go to one of these sites, read the briefs on the major types of licenses. Cabal in it, when you run it, gives you a whole list of licenses to choose from with templates that it knows about. Don't just pick one at random, go and read up on that. Go read up about it so you don't accidentally pick GP on some corporate code or something like that. And then back your legal team in a corner that they don't want to deal with. So back to the, cab the Cabal file. The Cabal file has a bunch of easy options at the top of it. You've got your name, your version, synopsis for the package, lots of metadata that we're familiar with and makes sense once again. Uh, then you get down to things that don't make so much sense, like the build type. Um, the other setting which you see for build type is custom, which tells it to phone out and find a Haskell file that has instructions of what it needs to do. You're not going to use custom until you started doing something which is really odd, by which case, at which stage you're probably six to 12 months in your Haskell journey and you've seen someone else try to do it, which has indicated that you should go and do this. So don't worry about changing that, leave it simple, it just says run the simple build script which compiles your Haskell file and gets it ready for all platforms usages. Um, oh, Cabal version. Uh, Cabal is a build tool that evolves. Cabal version instructs the minimum required version. It'll default to 1.10 at the moment, even though we're at Cabal version 1.22. If you use a feature that's not, not supported on Cabal.110, or by whatever number you have in the Cabal file, it'll warn you and tell you that you should bump this. So again, you don't have to worry about it until Cabal tells you about it. After this, there are three major sections of the Cabal file that you'll, be, that you'll encounter. And the first of these is the way you define an executable that you're building. You create a block called executable, you give it a name for that executable, which will usually also be used for the artifact name that it builds at the end. You tell it where the root directory is for any files or any modules that you try to go and import and use, which is the HS source does command there, uh, HS source does parameter there. That's actually a list, so you can have multiple source does and multiple po multiple resolution paths if you want them. They're resolved in order from top to bottom, so you can have source, source two, lib, and something else, and it'll look through them and find the first file, that, the first part that contains the package you're looking for. Then there's a parameter called extensions. As you're learning Haskell, you'll come across language features like overload strings or no prelude or a couple of other interesting things which extend the language and introduce new features. Typically, by convention, you put these at the top, at the top of the file that's using them. That gets a bit, uh, a bit of a maintenance nightmare when you've got 50 Haskell files somewhere. This lets you, this lets you apply them project-wide which is nice and convenient, but not necessarily advisable as a lot of the Haskell tools for development you will use won't go and look at the Cabal file and won't figure out that it needs to turn on these features and you'll get syntax errors that aren't really syntax errors. Build depends. You list your dependencies here and the versions that are required for them. Um, I'm going to skip over everything else I have in that because I'm running well and truly behind time. Default language. Haskell 2010 is the option you want for this. There's also Haskell 98 and a couple of other, other dialects. You can tour Haskell 2010 if you're doing anything recent or any sort of recent tutorial. And it's just usually the right answer. Second section you come across is library. 
if you're releasing a library for other people to use, include this instead of the executable. Exposed modules is a new option, which is a new parameter here. This defines what's available in your package. If you miss putting something in here, Cabal's not even going to try to link against it when you is when someone installs your package, and it'll just be not usable. Um, otherwise, all the options mean exactly the same thing as they did in the executable block. Third block you come across is the test um, the test suite block. You can have multiple test suites if you want them and configure them all differently and they all work. So split them up as much as you want to be comfortable. Um, the new option here is type. Almost always you want exit code, exit code standard I.O. There is another one called detail which is almost never used because it's really complex and everyone just read, went and wrote testing frameworks which do the complex part and then spit out a um, exit code from the program that it builds. So typically use exit code that's exit code standard I.O. Whichever testing framework you're using will tell you which version of that to use. So just follow their documentation for that. Um, otherwise, everything's the same. Your build depends for tests of, for your test suite are separate from the build depends for your library or your executable. They don't necessarily have to overlap or even line up. You can have conflicting versions in the two of them. The way you install the different sets are separate, and we'll come back to how you do that. So that's how you configure your package. Building the package. Cabal REPL will launch an instance of GHCI with your package loaded into it and ready to go. So you don't have to go and do manual imports and resolve paths yourself. It's all nicely tied up in one command. This will also make sure your sandbox is loaded and you can use that which is also really nice and something that GHCI doesn't do straight out of the box, does it? No. Good. So use that if you want to get into your sandbox and use your package and start playing around with your code. Cabal test, running it with no option to it, will execute every test suite that you define. If you run it with a name of a test suite, it'll run just that test suite name. So if you divide yourself up into all the tests or things like that, or you have a quick test loop, you can just define that one and use it. Cabal build takes your code, and if, you have, if you've defined an executable, will produce an executable artifact. If you're on Windows or .exe, if you're on any other platform, a binary file, and it'll tell you where it drops it, usually in a target directory. Cabal run, runs Cabal build, and then executes the executable that comes out of that. For both build and run, if you don't provide it a name, it picks the first executable you define the Cabal file. You can have multiple executables to find the Cabal file. You're not going to get any, in, you're not going to run any of the subsequent ones unless you specify them by name. Then there's two alterations on Cabal install. Cabal install only dependencies, looks at your Cabal file, pulls out all the dependencies from it, and tries to install all of them, but doesn't try to install the package which you're living inside of. Which is nice if you're rebuilding the sandbox to your test environment. And there's Cabal install enabled tests, which rather than looking at your library or your executables dependencies, looks at your test suite's dependencies. Which, like I said, they can be conflicting with one another. So your tests aren't installed, your test requirements aren't installed by default. You have to use enable tests if you want your test dependencies to appear anywhere for use. Okay. The first of the real development tools after Cabal, GHCI. If you've been doing any of the Cabal, any of the uh, Haskell tutorials or Haskell books or anything, you've been introduced to GHCI already as a way to run a REPL a way to inspect the type of functions or the kinds of functions if you're that far along. Um, and yeah, it's a console for executing Haskell stuff. The reason why I bring it up again is it's a tool that you've probably, probably encountered during the first chapter of your book is because it's not just a console REPL. You can use it to do all those inspections from the command line. And it's the main method which your IDE is eventually going to use for pulling out information about Haskell programs and analyzing types and looking up things. You'll never use it from the command line like that. You'll just use it directly as a console probably. But this is, it's worth mentioning that this is how your editor will end up doing most things. It's also worth mentioning that there's a package called GHCING. There's this guy called Chris Dunn who is getting a little bit prolific in Haskell tools and producing things that everyone wants to use. GHCING is his take on GHCI. It's an extension to it which adds better debugging information coming out of it, better code location details, adds some new features around analyzing your import statements. It does good things. It's required for some plugins you'll use on editors. Check the documentation for the plugins and they'll tell you if they require it or not. 
Otherwise, it's a drop in replacement for GHCI. HLint. HLint is magical and beautiful and amazing, and for a beginner, it is the most beautiful thing in existence. You've probably used linters in other languages like CopyLint or um, Perl Tidy or things like that that will look through code and look for things that look like common errors and tell you that you should fix them. Little dirty code smells and things. Because Haskell's so structured, you don't end up writing so many code smells. What you do end up writing is code that belongs in an imperative code base rather than a functional code base. And HLint has lots of um, rules built into it to find patterns that normally appear elsewhere and tell you to do them better. Such as in the first example there, it'll tell you to take out, it'll do basic things like tell you to take out brackets and things like that where they're not necessary. And in the second example, it knows about compose, so it tells you to join those two functions together and avoid looping over the data structure twice. It's good, it's full of lots of rules. Initially, you'll use it as a way to teach yourself to code better by following the warnings that it spits out. Eventually, you'll just use it as a sanitization tool to make sure you're not committing anything that looks stupid. But for a beginner, it gives you really good hints and starts you thinking differently about the way you write the code, so long as you follow all the rules. You can turn off any of the rules. You can turn them off by line, by function, by module, by file, by entire package for any of the rules you don't like. Otherwise, they're all on and good to go. The rules are primarily divided into three packages. The first of those is the default package. It has your basic things like spurious brackets and a lot of um, common misuses, like you've used fmap with a pen as opposed to using concat over a list. It'll warn you about that until you should use concat instead. Second major package is generalize. You'll come across things called type classes and monadic, um, monadic instances and things like that in Haskell. Generalize tells you to use more general versions of functions. So where you might use map over something, it'll tell you to use fmap, which is the mon monadic version of map, and it just works on more things without you altering the code. What I've just said then will make more sense after about six months of writing Haskell code. And the third one is dollar. Dollar gives you hints to use the dollar symbol and the dot symbol, which are apply and compose. They're an alternative to writing different functions and calling functional and things and instead prompts GHC to join functions together and makes it much easier to write partial functions which you'll encounter and aren't really within the scope of this talk. But anyway, it has a rule set for that which will generally push you along the, along the course of writing your code in that fashion. Last note about it, it's an iterative tool. It's not going to catch everything in the first pass. So run it once, run it again, keep on running it until all the warnings are gone or until you've silenced all of them. Second major tool that you'll want to be using is Google, which is a website. There's also a command line version of it, and you can also run it completely offline by building your own database, but the easiest way to use it is through the website. Google is Google for hassle. Rather than searching by search terms or stuff, which you can do, by the way. You can search by package name in Google or by function name, and it'll spit you out matching things from what it finds on package. Uh, but the better use of Google is when you have an idea of something that you want to do, and you can't think of the function that achieves it. So say that you've got an array of persons, and you have a way of turning a person into an employee, such as a function that hires them, and you intend to get a list of employees out. Even though the general package area doesn't have any idea of what a person is or what an employee is, it's out to figure out that you want to map and tell you what the general pattern is. And then we'll color code to where your variables should end up in the eventual function. So it's a really cool tool for once you have an idea of what you want to achieve, telling you how to achieve it. Um, you need to play with it to really fully appreciate how powerful that is, but you will because it's out there and it's amazing. Package. There's not much to say about Hackage as a tool, it's more of a repository for the font of all Haskell knowledge. It'll have details about every Haskell package which you'll probably be using, it'll have all the documentation, it'll have their dependency lists, who the authors are, how you can get in touch with the author when they have bugs, where the code repositories are so you can start going and looking at old bugs. All that sort of good information, it's all up there on Hackage, and it's also used as the back end for the file to talk to so it has somewhere to download package files from. Be aware of it, you'll end up searching it to find things. Another tool that you're not going to use directly is GHCmod. GHCmod is very old, 
20 years something? Uh, Not that old, 10 years? I wouldn't know. I, that doesn't seem that old to me. Okay. <laughs> It predates any of my involvement with Haskell, which isn't saying much, but it's been around for a, it's been around since like at least early two thousands. Yeah. What GHC Mod does is provides a programmatic API for accessing Cabal, GHCI, and HLint, and a couple of other minor tools, and it presents it in such a way that it's nice to use from an editor. A lot of the better editor plugins, which you'll end up using, all back onto this. The only reason I mention this tool and that, it's, that it exists is that you have to install this yourself for any of those plugin packages to work. So install it, don't try to use it for anything, just let the plugins use it. One day you might write your own plugin and you're back on the GHC mod, until then you don't have to worry about the crazy interface that it presents. So that's a bunch of useful tools to make things better. Let's talk about some editors. And we're going to start at Emacs because it's the granddaddy of everything and everything happens Emacs is capable of doing everything, so it's easy to explain functionality there and then point to how to do the same thing on other editors rather than do it the other way around. First plugin you'll end up installing on Emacs to make it nice and, Haskell nice and useful for Haskell is Haskell Mode. This provides Emacs with a way to do syntax highlighting, proper indentation for Haskell in a nice fashion. Gives it an interface to GHCI so it can dial out and get type information about code you have selected or functions which are currently under your cursor. And it also has integration to the GHCI REPL, so you can highlight a block of code and load that up in the REPL inside the browser. This is a nice starting point that gives you most of the things you're going to want to use in Haskell. Syntax highlighting and indentation is almost impossible to get by without them. The rest of it becomes really useful. Just being able to hover over a symbol and see what type it is is much easier than having to go and fetch through documentation to figure out exactly what it does. So first thing to go in is Haskell code. The second thing you might want to install is a package called GHC. GHC is the one-stop shop, the one-stop shop for everything that GHC mod does, and Emacs taps into all of it. It does code compilation. It does code warnings by going into HLint and pulling the errors of that into the breath, into Emacs. It does auto completion for symbols. It does different ways of doing indentation. It go, it goes and dials into Google so you can do Google searches. Uh, a bunch of refactoring tools such as moving things between files and stuff and changing the resolution and fixing up the imports. If you have a bunch of functions in your, in your buffer that aren't imported yet, it can figure out where they should be imported from and introduce the import, for, import statements for you. It does a lot of really cool things. I'm not a massive fan of this plugin because it does everything and you can't turn any of that off. I'm of the opinion that some features in it are done better by other plugins, but if you want an environment that's easy to set up and works, and you probably won't notice any of the problems that I have for your first 6 or 12 months of doing any Haskell stuff, then GHC and Haskell mod gets Emacs all the way up to standard on running a nice Haskell environment. If you want to use other plugins to do things, you have Flycheck, which is a... Anytime you pause editing a file, saves it to a temporary place, tries to compile it, and runs HLint against it, and gets those better those errors back into the editor for you. Nicely highlighted with red and things like that, like you'd expect. It's really good at doing it. GHC mod does the same thing, but I think Flycheck does it better. Um, yeah, use one or the other. Don't use them both at the same time because you'll have errors that pop up with Emacs which aren't very nice to deal with. If you don't want to use the autocomplete from GHC, you have a plugin called Company which is the auto-completion plugin for Emacs. It's really well featured to begin with. To get any information about Haskell, you need to install company GHC. This doesn't just, this will first of all try to auto-complete symbols from that it's already seen before in your buffers, so functions you've typed out and things. Beyond that, it'll go and look at the, fun, look at the modules that you've imported and auto-complete function names which are coming out of those modules. If you're trying to import a new module, it'll look at your file system, figure out what modules you have installed and what's in your cabal file, and you offer those dependencies as auto-completion lists. It'll help you auto-complete language features. It'll do lots of cool stuff which dials back, which is helpful and is good. But it's not going to offer up any options that... It's not going to offer up the function that you didn't try to import initially, which is really useful. 
It also does documentation lookup for any symbol you're trying to use. If it does go and bind you a function, you can load in a sub buffer the documentation attached to it so you can get a little bit more information. Last Emacs plugin that's worth mentioning is Structure Haskell Mode. Structure Haskell Mode is another one of Chris Dunn's brainchilds, brainchildren, and it is a different way of editing Haskell code. Rather than going and typing code and trying to match a syntax which Haskell can understand, it expects you to go and um, write your code in a structured tree, and then it figures out the indentation for you. Which sounds strange at first, but after writing Haskell for a while, you start to realize that everything is in nodes and can be arranged in trees, and has anyone used pair-edit or um, done any closure programming or list programming or anything like that? There's a couple of nods there. It's very similar to that sort of idea where everything is contained within something else. Structured Haskell mode lets you nicely move things around by manipulating the code structure rather than going and re-editing the entire file. It just takes care of all the indentation for you. This might work better for some people than trying to understand the Haskell syntax because you start to get a little bit zen about um, understanding the way Haskell code all fits together and then this takes care of all the minor details after that. And then I repeated the slide for some reason. Um, so that's all the plugins you probably want to go and probably going to want to know about. If you just want a Haskell environment that works, start with FirstLink. <coughs> Chris Dunn's produced a really nice starter Haskell kit for Emacs. Comes with structured Haskell mode turned on, which is the primary reason I'm mentioning structured Haskell mode, so it doesn't just look really weird out of the box. But it's got everything else there. It's got Haskell mode, it's got um, fly check, all those sorts of nice things set up and ready to go. If you want to get something more complex, and I don't recommend you use any of the other, either of the other two links directly, but use them for inspiration, there's mine, which is the bottom one there, and there's Nick Partridge, who's off the back of the room. Go and steal snippets from those files. We've got everything set up and more or less working in a nice fashion in our Emacs setups. And if you need help with either of those, we're available on ISC, so you can get easy reference to Vim. First package you'll start at is probably Vim the HS. Vim comes packaged with Haskell syntax highlighting, and it's not too bad. Vim, Vim the HS does it better. There's a bunch of features for Haskell which change the way Haskell syntax looks like. Things like quasi coating and regex highlighting and things like that, which aren't handled by the Vim default, default syntax highlighting. Vim to HS does them all very nicely and gets things looking good. Second thing it introduces, it, the second thing it introduces is syntax highlighting of your comments. Because literate Haskell is something which is used as widely as it is, and I should backpedal a second and say that literate Haskell is where you invert the precedence of code and comments. So your comments don't have comment marks in front of them, but all of your code has marks in front of it to indicate that it's code. The intention being that you're going to write two or three times as many comments as you are code, and this makes your code more literate by living inside documentation. Doing things like that, it's really nice to then have highlighting of your documentation if you're going to write it in a structured manner, like, map, like writing in Markdown or writing in LaTeX. It can highlight all that, which is nice. It also instructs Vim's inbuilt definition lookup how to find Haskell files, so you can highlight something which comes from a common library. Uh, I think it's GF, hit the keys GF, and it will jump to the file that contains that definition, so you can look at how that, fun how that function really looks. So that gives you a nice start and gets most things going straight away. Second major major plugin you're going to want is something to do syntax checking of your code and run GHC against it and report errors and run hlint against it. Syntastic does that really, really well. Runs all those, looks at your cabal file to get all the details out of that, respects that your sandbox exists and goes and dials that up to the cabal system, and then runs your code, produces errors, brings them back into the back into the editor in a way that you can start dealing with them. So that's really good as well. It's about as good as um, Flycheck is, perhaps better because, it does, because it's got tighter integration to GHC mod, same thing as that. Third plugin would be NeoComplete. NeoComplete is one of the options for auto-completion of symbols inside Vim, and it's sort of come out as the leading implementation. There's three compatible NeoComplete implementation, NeoComplete, NeoComplete Cache, and one that I'm forgetting the name of, it's got a really strange name. NeoComplete GHC works with all three and introduces the same sort of functionality <coughs> that company did into Emacs. 
gives you import lookup functions inside the imports that you've made, language feature lookups and all your completion. Also pulls in some documentation info to give you the type of signature of any function that you're looking at. Won't pull up any further documentation than that. GHC mod vim gives you the rest of what GHC mod yeah, gives you what I haven't covered so far and some of the other stuff. The only thing that it explicitly tries to avoid is auto completion of symbols, whereas the GHC mod for Emacs did, did all of that for you. It tries to avoid it because near complete GHC is so good. This will do syntax highlighting and stuff for you and compilation, not syntax highlighting. It'll do compilation errors and hlint warnings for you, which is nice. I still think that Syntastic does it better. Unlike the GHC mod in Emacs, you can turn any of those features off. It's extremely configurable, which is a very, very nice change. And it'll do type inspection. It'll, for any code that you highlight, it'll dial it to GHCI, get the type of the code, the type of the function, and pull it back in. Any function that you write, it will also try and figure out that type for you and let you auto substitute that in the code if you like putting types on everything, but you don't like typing them out yourself. That's enough about the two prime editors. For the other editors, Sublime's got some good support. There's a package called Sublime Haskell, which does most things. Go and figure that one out yourself, because I don't use Sublime, because I have trouble figuring out Python, or figuring out the way that works, I mean, so. Uh, there's a plugin for, for Eclipse called Eclipse FP, which I've been told works all right as a development environment. But if you've ever used Eclipse before, then you've had problems dealing with Java, Java class path resolutions. Imagine instead of doing that with Java, you're doing that with Haskell, and then imagine the editor wasn't really written for it, so it gets a bit messy. Uh, Adam's a new editor, the GitHub guys put out. Adam by itself is a bit immature. The plugins for it are also immature. If you're using Atom, you've probably encountered some teething problems with it already. You're going to get the same teething problems with the Haskell plugins, but there are Haskell people using it, writing some really cool Haskell plugins. So you've got good support there too. It's a plugin for IntelliJ. If you absolutely insist on using your commercial Java and JVM editor to write Haskell, there is a plugin that introduces Haskell stuff. IntelliJ is not a bad editor, it just seems like a misappropriation of a general purpose editor. Then there's the, the functional programming Haskell Center. There was a company called FP Complete, which tried to become the enterprise center of the world for Haskell. And they're not a bad company. They do offer a lot of good support to your, ha to your Haskell installations. They produced an IDE called FP Haskell Center. And for open source stuff, it's free to use. For commercial stuff, you've got to pay them a <coughs> certain amount of money, and you can have that discussion with your accountants. But it's a really good editor, it runs in the browser, it's all online in the cloud, and you, there is no setup necessary. So it's worth looking into and going and trying. I haven't played with it myself, but I've been told that it's really well featured and really good. Something really cool about that is it's got all the common libraries already built, so you don't need to spend the 10 minutes sandbox installing something. If you just want to go play with something, it's really cool, because you need to say, I want lens and this, and it'll just make it happen without any weight. So if you're just playing, it's really, really good. There are a lot of other tools out there that I wanted to mention, but I was running low on time, and I wanted to linger more on Cabal because it's the single tool that every single person writing Haskell is going to end up using, and it is confusing as all hell, and in some aspects because the documentation is giant. Um, but there's lots of other things out there. You have testing frameworks like Tasty and Doc Test and Quick Check. You've got documentation tools like Pandoc and Haddock. You've got code generator tools like Happy, which generates parses, and Alex, which generates Lexes. And you've got um, tools like HIndent, which pre-prints your Haskell code. All kinds of crazy things which are really useful that you can go out there and look at. But what I've mentioned are the core things that are used to make up an IDE. We've got a hack night on next Wednesday. I'm going to be there along with a bunch of other people. If you decide you want to put together a Haskell ID, put together a Haskell ID that works for you, come along and get some help. Otherwise, just um, grab us in the pub and tell us to help you or grab us on IRC because we'll always be there. And yeah, I've gone, I finished before seven, which is yep. good, so it's, <laughs> and pizza's here. So yeah, go forth, go, have fun. Nice. Yeah. You got time for questions if I have time for questions. I'll say. Do I have any questions? <laughs>
How does Kabul handle transitive dependencies and any conflicts in those? Uh, if you have any conflicts, it figures it out before it tries to install anything and tells you that it can't go any further. Um, yeah. Sorry, I'm a touch worn out and a touch, um, touch decaffeinated. Cabal has a really good way of figuring out the dependency graph. It's generally pretty good at it. As soon as it gets conflicts because the dependencies of things don't mesh up, it tells you about it. You're going to have to reach upstream at that point and tell someone to fix something up on their package or something like that, or manually move things around yourself in your own, in your own installation. It's not fun, but at least it stops you from doing anything bad to your installation or stops things bad from happening before they happen. Which doesn't really answer, yeah. Sorry. Anything else? I do a frivolous question about the version numbers. You mentioned the Haskell version numbers like four entries rather than three. Yep. Is there a, a definition of the difference between the first two numbers as first bit? The uh, second one clearly is breaks your build, you know, not that compatible. Is the first one what will offend all your fans? The first one's for I just rewrote the package. Oh, okay. So actually no relationship to the previous one. No. The only the only rule there's a massive documentation called the um, package version policy which describes how each of these should be used. Yeah. It doesn't define any difference between the first two digits. It just says A and B must be incremented. But as general practice, if you're incrementing the first digit, you've done something massive and rewritten the package rather than just added some features or done something. It's not just it's not yeah. 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 Or done something revolutionary. To it. For example, uh, you've got uh, a package called Lens written by Ed Comet, who wrote a fifth of the stuff that's up on Hackage. Um, it's up to version four point something now. And it's just they went through evolutionary stages of redefining what they wanted the package to do entirely. And changed the changed the um, what am I looking for? Not the theory. Changed the sense of how the package was meant to be used and all of the back end literature behind of it. Oh, so. I say I'm going to write it from scratch. That's the first number change. Yep. That's it. Oh, I hope. If you think of anything else, I'll be around for the and then after the club and on our Thank you. Cool. Uh, Pizza's just out here. The